to chapter 31 of our confession. We're just focusing on paragraph 1 tonight. I'm also going to begin our time by reading a significant portion of Acts 15. Not the whole chapter, but a lot of it. Acts 15, verses 1 to 29. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God visited, first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers, who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions... It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that as we turn to this next chapter in our confession of faith and see its foundation here in Acts 15, that we would see the importance Lord, of of what you would have to teach us of what this chapter says, and it says many things, but the importance of 
uh, governing assemblies for the health and well-being of your church. And so we pray you would instruct us, and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So our Confession of Faith, chapter 31, paragraph 1, says this, For the better government and further edification of the church, there ought to be such assemblies as are commonly called synods or councils. And it belongeth to the overseers and other rulers of the particular churches, by virtue of their office, and the power which Christ hath given them for edification and not for destruction, to appoint such assemblies, and to convene together in them, as often as they shall judge it expedient for the good of the church. So, in the previous chapter on church censures, we learned from the first paragraph in that chapter, the Lord Jesus, as king and head of his church, hath therein appointed a government, and the hand of church officers distinct from the civil magistrate. So Jesus has appointed a government in his church, and he's tasked those governing officials, from the last chapter we saw those officials are church officers, ministers, and elders, he's tasked his officers with exercising the keys of his kingdom, which includes preaching the gospel and exercising discipline. Those are the two keys. So government, then, is essential to the existence of the church. Uh, every church must have a form of government to be a true church. And so this means that a group of Christians who get together on Sundays to pray, to read the Bible, and to sing, that's not necessarily a true church. Okay? In our circles, they might be what's called a mission work, or a church plant, but they're not officially a church, at least not yet. And the reason, as Mark already shared in the missions report, the reason is because a church needs to be self-governing. It needs its own minister, its own elders, and that's what we try to do in foreign missions. We try to raise up indigenous churches, indigenous ministers and elders, a self-governing church in foreign lands. And so for a church to exist then and to function properly, it must therefore have a form of government, okay? And now the specific form of government that we hold to is Presbyterianism. A lot of people, when they hear the word Presbyterian, they might not think of church government at first. Maybe the first thing they think of is baptizing babies, which is true. <laughs> Those go together as well. But strictly speaking, Presbyterianism doesn't refer to the sacraments. It refers to our form of government. Uh, the Bible teaches, as we've seen, uh, that the church should be governed or ruled by presbyters or elders. And as this chapter says, these elders don't just govern the church on the local level. Uh, within Presbyterianism, there are other governing assemblies that are overseen by those very same elders. And so that's what this first paragraph in chapter 31 is about. It's, it's laying out the basics, kind of, of, of Presbyterian church government. Now, the Nicene Creed, which we recited this morning, it talks about the oneness of the church and the Catholicity of the church. The church is one, holy, Catholic, apostolic. All right, so the oneness and Catholicity of the church together, those terms basically mean that the church is to be connected, okay? The Bible doesn't endorse the idea of a church being independent from other churches. There's unity in the universal church, and so that unity and that connectionalism should then be reflected among churches that share the same beliefs and practices. Now, this is why we believe that being part of a denomination is so important. Um, a lot of folks don't like the idea of denominations because they say, well, it's not in the Bible, or denominations are inherently divisive, uh, but it's kind of ironic, considering the only alternative to denominations is to be independent, which doesn't exactly advertise unity. Um, so in reality, denominations are essential if there's to be real unity and, and cooperation among church bodies. Now, within Presbyterian denominations specifically, there's an even greater degree of unity and connectionalism because 
of the three-tiered structure that's inherent to our form of government. And so let's, let's walk through those governing assemblies. That's what we're focused on here. Remember, governing assemblies within Presbyterianism. So the first governing assembly is the session. Uh, the local church is governed by its session. Uh, the session is a term that literally means seated. Um, so the session is when the church is seated. When we have session meetings, the elders are seated at a table. That's what we're talking about. And the session consists of the pastor and the ruling elders. And those elders, of course, are elected by the congregation from among the congregation to serve as the congregation's representatives. A. A. Hodge says this in his commentary on this chapter. He writes that the whole governmental power of that particular church vests in that session, and all trials for the discipline of any of its members must originate there. Its decisions are final with respect to the matters subject to its jurisdiction, except when after having been regularly carried up by appeal, they have been reversed by a superior court. And so that's just laying out that, that the session is really the most foundational governing body in the church, and that the higher assemblies, which we'll soon get to, do not ordinarily poke their noses in the session's business to rule on, to micromanage the session. No, the session, our session here, has jurisdiction over you as members. We believe that's the Lord Christ's design. Um, and that is a good thing, right? Top-down authority can often goes bad. Um, so we believe in bottom-up authority um, in Presbyterianism. And so the local session has authority over its own members, and we want that. We like that. And now the second governing assembly is the presbytery, which is made up of the elders and ministers from all the local churches in a particular region, however that region is defined. Um, so each local church is represented at presbytery meetings by its pastor and its elders. And so our presbytery is the Presbytery of New Jersey, of the OPC, and we meet as a presbytery four times a year, and each meeting is basically a, a full work day. And maybe you've wondered, you know, what do Matt and the elders do at presbytery meetings? Or maybe you've never wondered that, and you're not too, you don't really care all that much. Um, but I'm going to bore you with some of the details anyway. It's actually important work um, that we do. Our presbytery has oversight over all the OP churches in our state. And to serve all of those churches well, we have what are called standing committees. Okay? Uh, ministers and elders serve on the standing committees of the presbytery. And at our presbytery meetings, the bulk of the meeting is the committees, you know, one by one, giving reports on their work and discussing any issues relevant to that committee's work with the rest of the presbytery. And so, for instance, I serve on the Candidates and Credentials Committee of our presbytery. Um, Matt Young used to serve on that committee with me. He's now uh, recently has hopped over to the Youth Committee of our presbytery, and Gus is, is serving with me on the Candidates and Credentials Committee now. And there are other ministers. Dave Haar is also the chair of that committee, so I work with him. He's the pastor at the Medford Church. And so there are ministers and elders on this committee, and, and our committee handles everything related to aspiring ministers. Okay, so if there's a guy who wants to be an Orthodox Presbyterian pastor in the state of New Jersey, he works with our committee. He has to, we are the, the gatekeepers, so to speak. He goes through our committee. And there are a lot of exams, as you know, um, Zach just did his licensure exams not too long ago. He worked with our committee uh, to do that. So there's exams, there's procedural things, administrative things, lots of stuff that needs to happen uh, for a guy in seminary to become an ordained minister. But that's just the committee I'm on. There's also a home missions committee of the Presbytery. And our home missions committee oversees the boardwalk chapel work and also all the Orthodox Presbyterian church planting efforts in our state. There's the Judicial Committee, which people don't like to serve on that one, um, because if you get a judicial case, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, so we're really thankful for the guys that do serve on that committee, but they handle all the disciplinary issues 
related to ministers, um, because my membership as a pastor is not in the local church here. My membership is at the presbytery level. And so any ministerial discipline issues are handled by the judicial committee of the presbytery. And they also handle any appeals that come to the presbytery from discipline cases in the local church. And so we censure a member, uh, suspending him from the Lord's Supper for whatever reason. He disagrees. He can appeal that, and it's sent up to the presbytery. The presbytery hears, hears the case, and they say, no, this member, you know, the, the session was right to censure you. You need to submit to the session. Or, no, the session, you messed up, and here's why, and you need to reverse the, the censure or something along those lines. So there's appeals that the Judicial Committee handles. Mark uh, Williams, he serves on the Fraternal Relations Committee of the Presbytery, and that committee seeks to cultivate fellowship with what's called churches of like faith and practice, which are other Presbyterian denominations. Think of uh, the PCA, URC, the RPC, NA, um, those kinds of bodies. And so at our Presbytery meetings, each committee reports on its work. Uh, we discuss relevant issues. Uh, we also pray for our churches. We begin every Presbytery meeting um, you know, with any minister or elder who wants to stand up and share matters for prayer in their congregation. We pray over those things. And after all the work is done, we adjourn and we go home. And so then there's the third governing body of, uh, the Presbyterian, of Presbyterian churches, um, and that's the governing body overseeing the, the whole church, the whole denomination, the national church, and that's called the General Assembly. Uh, the OPC's General Assembly meets once a year for a whole week, basically, and it's composed of officer representatives from all the presbyteries. And so any officer can go to General Assembly, really any, any church member can go, um, but there, we have what's called commissioners um, to Presbytery and to General Assembly. Uh, but those who are commissioned to go are those who are elected and voted on to go, and only they can vote at these meetings. And so anybody can attend, but not everybody can, can vote, only commissioners. And so you can think of our General Assembly as one giant Presbytery meeting. <laughs> That's what it is, which I know sounds thrilling. Um, but that's basically what it is. It has its own standing committees. Um, those committees, uh, we just heard about the Foreign Missions Committee, uh, all those committees report on their work. Um, they also deal with disciplinary matters, um, with appeals that come up from the presbyteries uh, to the General Assembly. It's kind of like, you know, in our, um, with the civil magistrate, how appeals from lower courts can go up to higher courts, to the Supreme Court even. We handle things the same way. And the General Assembly also discusses um, often contemporary issues facing the church. You know, what do ministers and elders think about issues in the culture and those kinds of things, and um, so we discuss a lot. And now this idea that the, the officers of various churches should come together to form these governing assemblies it's implied uh, in a lot of places in the Bible. Um, we deduce it from a lot of places in Scripture, but the passage where it's explicitly and clearly taught is the one that I read from, um, at least in the New Testament. It's Acts 15. And so, as you heard, as I read the passage, a controversy arose in the early church about the application of the Mosaic Law, the Old Covenant Law, to Gentile believers. Do they need to be circumcised to be saved or not? That was the issue, and as you heard from the text, some said yes. Believers from the, the party of the Pharisees. Remember, Paul was a former Pharisee, and so there were Pharis Pharisaical believers, so to speak. Um, but they said yes, the Gentiles need to be circumcised. Others said no. So what happened? Well, they discussed it. Um, the correct answer, obviously, is, is no. Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. A salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And nowhere in that equation is man's works under consideration. Uh, our works don't in any way contribute to our salvation. Um, but for our purposes, notice that this controversy about works righteousness, essentially, um, that this controversy in the early church 
was not something that every local church ruled on by itself. It was not an issue that all the local churches just considered independently of one another, of what other church leaders, elders, ministers were saying. They did not handle the issue that way. In Acts 15, local churches were told they sent representatives to this meeting that we know of as the Jerusalem Council. And these officers, both elders and apostles, they debated, they discussed, they ruled on the matter, And then the council sent its decision to all the local churches by way of letter. And so the decision of the Jerusalem council wasn't just a piece of advice. It was not just a suggestion. It wasn't, you know, hey, we we think it's a bad idea for Gentiles to be circumcised, but, you know, you can do whatever you want in the end. No, that's not what they did. This was an authoritative decision and declaration handed down to the churches from a higher judicatory, a higher governing assembly. And it's based upon this example in Acts 15 that A.A. A. A. Hodge writes this. He says, in carrying these principles into effect, the constitution of the Presbyterian Church provides for the erection and operation of a regularly graduated series of ecclesiastical councils. And so, basically, this passage in Acts 15 affirms Presbyterianism, that we have regularly graduated um, tiers of ecclesiastical councils, the session, the presbytery, the general assembly. We get that right from Acts 15, this higher assembly of the Jerusalem council. Um, So whether or not you want to call that a presbytery in Acts 15 or a general assembly, it doesn't really matter. It proves Presbyterianism (laughs) is the point. Um, Now, Having established the biblical warrant and necessity of governing assemblies, we're going to take a slight detour. Uh, This is another one of those sections in our confession. Uh, Maybe you already know this. It's a section where the American Presbyterians revised what the original assembly had written, what was originally written down by the Westminster Assembly in the 17th century. Um, In 1643, uh, England's long parliament called the Westminster Assembly, which was composed of 120 reform ministers, mostly Puritans, which were English, of course, along with a handful of Scottish Presbyterians who were also there. And this assembly was tasked by the English parliament with making proposed changes to the doctrine, worship, and government of the Church of England. And so what we have here is a governing body of the church that was officially called by the civil magistrate to propose changes to its national church. And now this is a wonderful thing, okay? I mean, imagine for a moment our president, you know, calling ministers from Reformed and Presbyterian denominations to... To, to get together and to propose changes for America's religious identity. I mean, I would jump at that opportunity. That would be a dream come true, right? That's what happened in England in 1643. But why is this historical situation relevant to this particular chapter in the Confession? Well, because this chapter originally had five paragraphs in it and not four. When the Assembly wrote this chapter... The first paragraph only said this. It said, For the better government and further edification of the church, there ought to be such assemblies as are commonly called synods or councils. That's it. That was the whole first paragraph. It didn't have all that other stuff that our first paragraph has, um, because ours in the hymnal, um, the one that I read to you, That is one of the revisions adopted by the American Presbyterian Church in 1788. So in addition to this, the original confession written in 1646, it had a second paragraph in this chapter. In this second paragraph that was originally written, the American Presbyterians did not adopt. And so you won't see this paragraph in your hymnal, but I'm going to read it to you. And as I read it, Remember the historical situation that I described in 1640s England, that it was the English Parliament that called the assembly together. 
So the original second paragraph to this chapter in our confession said this, As magistrates may lawfully call a synod of ministers and other fit persons to consult and advise with about matters of religion, so if magistrates be open enemies to the church, the ministers of Christ, of themselves by virtue of their office, or they with other fit persons, upon delegation from their churches, may meet together in such assemblies. And so, since the English Parliament called the Westminster Assembly together, it makes sense that in this chapter on church synods and councils, the assembly would put a paragraph like that in our confession. Uh, the assembly believed, in other words, that the civil magistrate had the authority to officially call and form church assemblies. Okay, and over in England, there was a national church. There was, the, the Church of England. England had a distinct religious identity at the time, and that identity went beyond just saying that, you know, we're a Christian nation in a broad sense. Now, England had a national church with its doctrine, its polity, and its worship all supported and backed by the state. But the American Presbyterians didn't like the idea of magistrates calling church councils, uh, because for one thing, and I agree with the revisions on this point, uh, Scripture does not give magistrates this authority in the New Covenant era. Um, if you look back to the Old Covenant with Israel, you could justify this kind of thing where the, the state calls the church to convene for a specific purpose. Israel was a geopolitical theocracy. They had a land, right? Which means that church and state at the time of Israel were more or less united together. And so you have examples in the Old Testament of kings like Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah and Josiah. They involved themselves in Israel's religious affairs as magistrates, as kings, and they were allowed to do that. That was by God's design for his old covenant people. But things are different in the new covenant era. Today, it's the church that's identified as the new Israel. God established his covenant with Abraham, and those promises given to Abraham are certainly, uh, were certainly fulfilled in Israel, in part at least, but the covenant made with Abraham, it finds its ultimate expression and its ultimate fulfillment not in the old Israel of the old covenant, but in the new Israel of the new covenant, in the church. In our age, God's covenant community is not confined to a particular land, a particular nation. Instead, the church is spread out across the whole world with no land to call our home. And so if the church is to be identified with old covenant Israel, we're more like Israel in exile, right? When they were exiled in Babylon, that's, more, that's a better parallel of the church today. We're we're not so much like Israel when they were in the promised land itself. Unlike what we see in much of the Old Testament, church and state are now distinct and separate entities. And so both uh, realms are ordained by Christ, both are ruled by Christ, both are accountable to Christ for how they carry out their God-given responsibilities and duties. But each church and state has its own functions, its own distinct powers, and its own distinct jurisdictions. Now remember that in the chapter on church censures, chapter 30, the first paragraph, told us that Jesus has instituted a government in his church that's distinct from the civil magistrate. And so the Lord has not given civil magistrates of any nation the authority and right to call church assemblies. And now magistrates can certainly ask the church to do something, but it can't require the church to do something. For instance, our, our governor can ask all the OP ministers in our state to come to Trenton, to go before the state legislature, and to explain uh, the Bible's view on abortion. And we'd be more than happy to do that. I know I would. But our governor can't mandate that we go. He can't require it. He can't call an official assembly. He doesn't have that authority. Um, he can't call us to go to Trenton and produce some document like the Westminster Assembly did, a document where we outline 
you know, the reformed view of abortion or anything like that. Uh, the magistrate's jurisdiction is limited to his particular sphere, to his realm, and that's not the realm of the church. The idea that magistrates can call for church assemblies and that the church must carry out those directives given to it by the state, that's an Erastian form of civil government. Um, that means the state has authority over the church, which really subjects the church to tyranny. Um, the Lord simply hasn't given civil authorities that kind of power. And as paragraph 1 says, it belongeth to the overseers and other rulers of the particular churches by virtue of their office and the power which Christ hath given them to appoint such assemblies. In other words, the power and authority to call assemblies of the church, it rests ultimately in Christ. He is the head and king of the church, and he's delegated that power to ministers and elders, and not to magistrates. And so you can see that there were strong theological reasons that led the American Presbyterians to disagree with the original second paragraph of this chapter. But of course, the American Presbyterians had their own historical reasons as well for not adopting the original second paragraph. Um, this chapter of the Confession was revised and adopted, as I said, by the Presbyterian Church in America in 1788 when the Synod of New York and Philadelphia met over in Philadelphia. And so if the year is 1788, when they officially adopt this revision to this chapter, what just finished five years earlier? A big war, right? The Revolutionary War, which was fought because the 13 colonies, were un which were under English rule, they were not being fairly represented in English Parliament, and it was over taxation, of course. No representation, no taxation without representation, that famous phrase. Uh, King George was treating the American uh, colonialists as second-class English citizens, and so the Americans had been living under a tyrannical civil magistrate. And one thing led to another, war breaks out, the Americans win, and here we are as a result. And so in 1788, the American Presbyterians convened then, five years after the war ends, they convene in Philadelphia, they look at that original second paragraph of the confession in this chapter, which gives magistrates a lot of power over the church, and they understandably are not too fond of it. Um, so they don't like it, first and foremost, for biblical reasons, but in God's providence, they had just spent eight years fighting a war against tyranny, against a magistrate who abused his power. And so given the reasons for the war, it simply didn't make much sense for the church to cede that kind of power to the state. And yes, the state can, you know, call church assemblies and we have to obey. They weren't fond of that. And so from the example of the Jerusalem Council in the Bible, we learn that assemblies are for the better government and the further edification of the church, and that the power to call such assemblies, though, that that power belongs exclusively to the overseers and rulers of Christ's church.